Thank you so much again, once again, for joining us today. This panel is part of an exhibition that was curated by myself and the artist Laurel Nakadati, who I see in the attendance. Hi, Laurel, thank you so much for coming. Um, Laurel and I worked on this exhibition over the course of about just about two years. Um, she had previously worked on a portion of labor um, as a show that she curated for um, uh, Leslie Tuffin Gallery in New York, New York, called uh, Mother. And um, that exhibition then evolved once we were opening our brand new building in Las Cruces, the new museum was opening. I approached Laurel after seeing that exhibition and told her that I was looking to create, what do you, how do you start a brand new building? What's the birth of a brand new building look like? And I was looking to make it all artists who were thinking about having compelling conversations, having urgent conversations about motherhood and looking at the concept of parenting and motherhood from early feminist artists like Mary Kelly, um, starting with a, a video that she did called um, Antipartum as part of her postpartum document. Um, in, the, in the early 70s to artists that are making work right now and incorporating the concept of motherhood or mothering or parenting or working with their children into their practice. So Labor Motherhood and Art in 2020 opened in February 28th of 2020 in the New University Art Museum. And it really looked at these concepts of motherhood in today's socio-political climate with artists such as Tracy Barron, Maria Barrio, Patty Chang, Lenka Clayton, Amy Cutler, Joey Farso, Tierney Garon, Kate Gilmore, Jessica Jackson Hutchins, Las Hermanas Iglesias, um, Mary Kelly, Justine Curlin, Marilyn Minter, our co-curator, Laurel Nakodati, um, Yoko Ono, Catherine Opie, Lori Simmons, Wendy Redstar, Mickalene Thomas, and it, the list goes on. We were so proud of this exhibition, which really thought a lot about our community while looking at these inspiration internationally recognized artists. And so while that exhibition unfortunately closed about two weeks after it opened, um, we have extended that exhibition to December 6th. So we do hope that you will all, as audience, the audience members that are on here, at some point be able to walk through the doors and see that exhibition that Laurel and I love and cherish and I know meant so much to Laurel and means so much to me and our community. Um, so this part of the program that you're now part of is sprung out of the fact that so quickly because of COVID-19, we had to close the doors. We wanted to take a lot of the programming that was starting, that was in existence, um, as well as we really wanted to make sure that we were creating programming, that we could create programming that would help do what we hope the programming with, with uh, labor would do, which is to connect mothers within our community with this international group of mothers and parents and people that were thinking about parenting and, 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 and motherhood. And, and really we were looking and hearing so many conversations of parents becoming teachers and you know, homeschooling their children, being home all day with their children. How do we make sure that we could have programming um, that really spoke to them and showed our community and especially our artists and community mothers um, the importance of, of art during these times. We are so lonely, we could be so disconnected and so lonely. How do we create a safe space for people to still um, understand what we were trying to get across with labor uh, in their homes? And so Alone Together sprung out of, out of that. Um, and I'm so proud that this, that this panel is part of that programming. Um, I was very lucky to work with Lisa and Janelle. I will not do your introductions. Kimberly York is going to do your introductions, but I wanted to thank you way, way um, in front in the beginning of this panel because you guys worked so hard on making this program um, speak to parents um, a different part of parenting, right? A part of parenting that we might not often speak about that can be difficult, that can be challenging. 
Um, I also wanted to thank um, Julia Borello in the Department of Art at NMSU, uh, Liz Shermer and Patty Wohan, who uh, from Gender Studies and, and English, um, who supported this panel for us as co-sponsors. And um, we also want to thank the University of Minnesota Press um, for, for spreading the word about this event and Frank Sage, who's helping us on the back end with te technology. Um, I will say that there are going to be, uh, this is a topic that might be triggering for some, and we want to make sure that we tell all of you that before we begin. And I always like to do a little disclaimer about Zoom. Um, my dog snoring in the background. Uh, disconnects might happen. There is not perfection in this medium. We've done a lot of programs now and spoke to hundreds of people and it's never the same. So don't get discouraged if you got to pop on and pop back in. We will make this work for everyone. So without further ado, let me introduce Kimberly York, the moderator of this panel. Kimberly is a native of Cleveland, Ohio. She is an independent licensed clinical social worker with 20 years of nonprofit leadership experience. She's a former adjunct professor in the School of Social Work at New Mexico State University and was re recently appointed as interim director of Black Programs. She earned dual master degrees in social administration and nonprofit organizations with a nonprofit management certification from Case Western University. She's a doctoral student at Grand Canyon University, completing a PhD in, psycho in psychology with an emphasis in industrial and organizational psychology. She co-founded So Who, Serving Others While Helping Ourselves, Enterprises, a not-for-profit. Um, and as a servant leader, she currently serves as a member of our governor, governor uh, of the state of New Mexico, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham's New Mexico Office of African American Affairs, and very recently, and we're so proud of this. She was appointed to the governor's um, council of New Mexico racial justice, which is imperative right now with what's going on in, a, in our um, definitely United States, but global um, society. So without further ado, please moderate this beautiful panel. We are so excited to have. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you everyone for joining us for this very important conversation. I would like to now um, do our land acknowledgement New Mexico State University honors Native American knowledges and worldviews based on intimate relationships to the natural world. The genesis of the Southwest indigenous peoples, including the Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, established their guardianship of the lands now occupied by New Mexico State University. As the state's land grant university, we acknowledge and respect the sovereign Indian nations and indigenous people. We pledge to have a meaningful and respectful relationship with the sovereign Indian nations, indigenous communities, and Native American peoples within the institution. Again, we would like to thank you for joining in on such a meaningful conversation. We also would like to thank all of the panelists who have agreed to courageously share their stories. And at this time, I'm going to introduce them as they will be presenting to you. Shannon Gibney is an award-winning author of books of all kinds, from novels, from novels to anthologies, to essays, to book, to picture books. She writes for adults, children, and everyone in between. The through line in Gibney's work is stories that may have previously gone untold. Sometimes these perspectives have remained hidden because the speakers have not had an outlet, an outlet for their stories, or, other or oftentimes, the stories carry darkness and fear that they would prefer to, let, to look away from. What is God? What is God honored here? Writings on miscarriage and infant loss for, excuse me, by and for Native women and women of color, the University of uh, Minnesota, Press, October 2019, exemplifies this approach as Gibney's most recent novel, Dream Country, Dutton, 2018, which Kirkus describes as a necessary reckoning of tensions with the of African diaspora, an introduction to its brokenness and a place to start healing. Gibney's books 
and writings have, re have received many awards and are taught in schools and communities around the country. She is a professor of English at, Minis at Minneapolis Un uh, College, where over, excuse me, for over 12 years, she has worked with refugees, ex-offenders, international and in-country immigrants, indigenous and communities of color, the stu and students from all walks of life to tell their stories and achieve their academic and professional goals. I introduce to you, Shannon Gidney. Hi everyone, um, thank you for being here. Um, yeah, I just wanna sort of uh, also give the, the Zoom caveat. I do have uh, a 10 year old and a five year old and um, there are two dogs as well um, and uh, uh, grandparents in the house. So um, we, we may or may not have uh, uh, various quick interruptions here. Uh, my mother, um, who is actually upstairs, she's also um, a member. Oh, oh, okay. Um, yes, and that's my daughter giving me a message that, okay, I will deal with. Um, my mother um, actually found these, she knew exactly where they were. These are pictures, Boise. These are pictures of, um, I don't know if you can see, um, my daughter, a CNA, Corpo Corva. The anniversary of her birth and death is coming right up in six days. She was born on August 27th, 2013. She was stillborn um, 41 and a half weeks. Um, so she was about 10 days late. And when I went into labor, they could not find the um, heartbeat. So, um, yeah, so those are just some pictures, I guess, that I shared to share my story, parts of it, and also just to give further context to our talk today. Um, I'm so grateful to everyone who's here now. This is not an easy topic to talk about, um, but it's a necessary topic because um, it's miscarriage especially is so common um, and stillbirth is you know less common but as I found out um, even the less common things in life can happen to you um, and these are if we don't talk about it then it it becomes like a secondary trauma um, so because of that um, oh I, I should also just say I don't want to go on forever, but I just want to thank um, um, Las Hermanas Iglesias um, for, and everybody at the New Mexico um, State University Museum of Art um, and everyone affiliated with them for pulling this together as well. Um, this was a really nice surprise, I think, for um, Kalia, my co-editor, and I to, to um, be involved and invited to, and we really appreciate these discussions. Um, this is our book. Um, it's called What God is Honored Here, Writings on Miscarriage and Infant Loss by and for Native Women and Women of Color. And um, myself and my marvelous editor, Kao Kalia Yang, um, co-editor who you're going to meet in a minute here, um, we had the very great honor of editing this collection. <clears throat> Separate from us, there's about 22 um, Native women and women of color in this collection who have beautifully shared their very emotionally layered experiences of miscarriage and infant loss. Um, and I know, yeah, we just feel it, it's it's been work <laughs> it's a journey but it's an honor also to hold all these stories um and so i'm just going to read a little bit from the introduction and then a tiny teeny bit from my story um because i know we need to keep moving here miscarriage stillbirth neonatal loss fetal and infant death none of these words were new to us we were writers we were women, 
We were daughters. We were mothers. We were on our way to becoming mothers. And yet our knowing the words could not prepare us for the experience of them. None of who we had been None of who we had been could have prepared us for who we would become in the wake of these words. Grief is a lonely place we have all visited by ourselves, occasionally with others. Some of us have built homes to house our grief. Others shiver in the storms that break, unsure of where to hide, how to hide, whether they want to hide. Each of us in our own ways and for many of us through our words has encountered grief. All of us have awoken from despair, only to find ourselves forsaken on its shores. Six years after the loss of baby Jules, a miscarriage at 19 weeks, even in the years after when Kalia had given birth to a living daughter and two sons, she still feels the ghost of him swimming inside late at night and early in the morning when the world is quiet and dark. When the bigness of the sky enters through the window of her bedroom, when her husband is on his left side, lost in his sleep, when behind the wall of the bed, she can make out the twists and turns of her sleeping children. Her hands move high on her soft belly so she can feel the force of life within her. In the space of possibility, baby Jules moves inside of her, no longer as low as he had been. In fact, less than in her womb, he now swims close to her beating heart. Four years after my first daughter, CNA, died inside of me at 41 and a half weeks, I, Shannon, feel her everywhere. She never made it into this particular world, but she made a home of me for nine long months, growing and becoming. Cradling her long, thin body in my arms after she was born, I had a new knowledge of how love can cleave you from the inside out. Waiting, dreaming, hoping for a baby to take a breath, who could never take a breath, waiting for the truth to become something living. There is no recovery from the loss of life's possibilities. We both tried in our different ways to make peace with what had transpired. But it was the simple knowledge that we were not alone in the experience, we had never been and never would be, that taught us both that life would continue as if our babies had never lived if we didn't do something to commemorate their existence all of their existences. Although we would never do the work of raising them, we had to raise ourselves, do the hard work of living in the absence of who they and we could have been together. In the days, months, and years after, we both looked desperately for answers in medical studies, statistics, and literature, and in life for some response to our experiences beyond the immense loss. We were doing what we had been trained to do as writers, finding meaning in human experience. In that spirit, in the course of our journeys of loss, we looked to what we both love for answers, literature. Alas, all that we could find for grieving mothers was written by white women and often reflected only their experiences, and thus, without thought or intention, marked the disappearance of our own experiences as grieving mothers, as women of color. Where were the pregnancies like ours? Where were the babies like ours? Where were we in this world of longing? After the loss of our pregnancies and babies, we both knew we wanted to write of our experiences individually, but we had a suspicion that we needed each other's strength to finish the work. Still, we couldn't get ourselves to turn the page because we were not yet ready, so we let the days turn into nights, the moon orbit around the earth, the earth orbit around the sun, and we watched our stories of motherhood change and each other grow in the changes. We both had more children, we both came to a place where we knew the children we had were the only ones we would give birth to. As storytellers, we wanted to dive into and recuperate the narrative gap. We wanted the women and families who experienced fetal and infant death to be able to represent themselves and their particular truths. We wanted the babies who have been lost to become embodied and to discard their ghostly presence in the larger societal narrative. We lovers of language, wanted to journey into the landscape of loss with other indigenous women and women of color and to return from it with a token of what could and could not be delivered in the promise of motherhood, in the living and the dying that we go through as daughters, sisters, and mothers. This project is our claim on our lives as indigenous women and women of color who have experienced infant loss and fetal loss 
in its many forms. So I'm gonna stop there for the introduction. That's the introduction um, to the collection, um, which is predominantly um, short memoir pieces, um, but there's also uh, just a few pieces of fiction and a few pieces of um, poetry. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to read just uh, one short page because I know, again, we're, we're short on time here. Um, my piece is called CNA, The Trip Was Good. Um, and CNA's father um, is Loma, um, which is an indigenous group in um, northern Ghana. And her name meant um, the trip was good. That's what her name means. So this is when I was rushed to the hospital. I went in again for um, contractions and my midwife could not, I went into the midwifery cl clinic that I'd been going to and they couldn't find the heartbeat. So then they rushed me to the hospital. Um, and then they uh, took me to the OBGYN ward and they hooked me up to an ultrasound. We're just gonna see what's going on, says the doctor, looking me carefully in the eyes. She appears to be in her late thirties like me and her thin blonde hair is pulled to the nape of her neck in a black plastic clasp. I nod. I don't want to be here. I lie down on the bed. The doctor sits on the chair beside me. She squirts some transmission fluid on my raised stomach and an image of a baby lying on her back, feet up comes onto the screen. The baby is not moving. The baby has no heartbeat. Two more doctors come into the room and stand next to Amy, that's my midwife, who is seated in the corner. Okay, says the doctor with the ultrasound probe. So yes, the baby has no heartbeat. She puts the ultrasound probe down and stands up. I look from her back to the screen and the baby still isn't moving. Okay, I say. I want to ask her how to get the heartbeat started again, but some part of my brain is telling me not to say that. I'm sorry, she says. I'm so sorry. I look to Amy, then each of the three doctors beside her. Discomfort drains their faces, though I can see they are trying hard to mask it. I wonder how it feels to have to tell a woman something like that and then still be expected to remain professional. It must not be easy. I ask if I can go to the bathroom. Once inside the bathroom, I grip the sink until my knuckles are white and stare into the spotless mirror. The woman looking back at me has dark brown eyes that hold nothing. What was once a sharp chin is now round and plump. Her hair frizzes all over from the humidity. I turn on the faucet as high as it will go and flush the toilet. Then I scream. The woman in the mirror screams and lets go of the sink as she does it. She wonders if she is just a copy of herself today and if her real self is back at home washing dishes. She does not wanna go back into the patient room because she knows they will tell her what she has to do next. And she does not want to know what she has to do next. She does not want to leave the bathroom because she will have to say to her husband, our baby is dead. She does not want to call her mother because her mother will cry and nothing will make her stop. She does not like to see or hear her mother cry. She will have to rewrite the story of the pregnancy and the baby coming, the happy house, her young son so eager to be a brother. Now the story will center on a chapter in which the eagerly awaited baby dies in utero, never to be cuddled and warmed in her arms, never to scream and demand a diaper change, never to suckle her breast. The woman does not want that story. She is not ready for it, for what it will mean, not just now, today, tonight, but forever, for the rest of her life. The weight of that story could crush all other stories of her life and the lives of those she loves. She does not want that. She is too tired and she wants to sleep. She wants to awaken. Thank you. I'm gonna pass this on to um, Kalia and I'm actually also going to put a um, link in the Q&A to our, um, it's just a, it's a short video um, where um, some of the contributors in the book um, read parts of it as well. Thank you so much for listening and being here.
Shannon, thank you so much for your transparency and your willingness to share. Uh, we will now turn to Kyle Khalil Yang. Kyle Khalil Yang is an award-winning Hmong American writer. She holds degrees from Carleton College and Columbia University. Yang is the author of the memoirs, The Late Homecomer, a Hmong, a Hmong family memoir, and The Song po uh, Poet. The Late Homecomer is the first Asian American authored and centered book to be added to the roster of the American Place Theater's Literature to Life program. The Song Poet has been commissioned as a youth opera by the Minnesota Opera and will premiere in the spring of 2021. Yang has, is also the author of the children's book, A Map into the World and The Shared Room. She co-authored the groundbreaking collection, What God is Honored Here, writings on miscarriage and loss and infant loss by and for indigenous women and women of color. In the fall of 2020, Yang will have two new books, a collective memoir about refugee, about refugee lives titled Somewhere in the Unknown World, Somewhere in the Unknown World, and another book for children called The Most Beautiful Thing. Kyle Khalil is a, is a recipient of the International Institute of Minnesota's Olga Zoltai Award for community leadership and service to Native American, excuse me, to New Americans in the Ordway Center for the Performing Arts 2019 Salary Award for Social Impact. I bring to you Kyle Kalia Yang. Thank you, Kimberly, for that wonderful introduction. I'm gonna have to shorten it way up next time. But <laughs> thank you all for joining us today. Shannon, I've never seen those photos, so thank you for sharing with us, sharing Sandy's photos with us. August is a big month in my life, too. Um, August is the month where I lost baby Jules. August was the month where I got married. August uh, is also the month where my little boys and my little girl will celebrate their fifth and seventh birthdays. And so it is very fitting that today I get to read from my contribution to the, um, to the collection, What God is Honored Here. This is called In the Month of August. So August 6, 2011. We stood in front of our family and our friends. We extended our wrists in the fashion of my people, and we received the blessings of those who loved us and wished us well. White cotton strings filled our wrists and anchored us to each other in marriage. I found myself in a shared life, planning a shared future. Late at night, when the world had grown quiet and the busy of the day had dimmed, we both looked out our bedroom window. A square full of sky, starlight and moonlight mingling, airplanes and shooting stars shifting across the high heavens. We talked of the future. We whispered of babies. There in that talk, without our knowing, we planted our first seeds of grief together. August 2012 was hot. The tall grass fields across the Minnesota prairie were thirsty, drying at their tips, golden in the hot sun like fields of wheat. The earth was cracked in places thirsty for rain. Big grasshoppers flew, their wings widespread across the fields of tall grass. Beneath the sun, they resembled butterflies. My husband and I were happy about our first pregnancy. We got the best prenatal care we knew how to get from his graduate student health care at the university. We kept all of our appointments at the midwife's clinic in the big hospital downtown. We walked often. We made sure that I ate healthy foods. I took the prenatal vitamins, especially the folic acid, despite the fact that I struggled to swallow the big pills down. I watched as my belly began to grow round. At 19 weeks, my regular clothes no longer fit. I invested in yoga pants and maternity tights. I engaged in conversation about how there was no maternity wear for women under five feet tall, and I laughed. It was with great excitement that I scheduled my first ultrasound. I scheduled the ultrasound for a weekday. I took the first available appointment of the morning, 8.15. Outside the late afternoon sun, outside the late summer sun was already beginning its work. 
I felt the hot rays on the back of my neck heating up my hair. In the hospital parking ramp, the cement held on to the coolness of the night. In the there were parking spaces galore that morning. I pointed to the plethora of excellent spaces close to the elevators. Together, my husband and I rejoiced, believing that the available parking spaces were just one more blessing in a world full of them. We held hands as we walked to the OB testing unit. There was a lightness to my step that I hadn't felt in months. My husband held my hand firmly in his warm one. Occasionally, I touch my belly with my free hand. If I could live in that moment of sunshine, make that walking ramp longer, miles and miles longer than it actually was, kept my girlish spirits high, I would. But alas, I couldn't. In the dim ultrasound room, I rested on the bed, my dress high on my chest, the hill of my stomach wet with warm gel. My husband sat beside me in the chair. He continued holding one of my hands, playing with my fingers. We watched as the screen flickered on with the press of a button. I saw the spine of my baby, curved in a ball, turn toward the dark of my belly. The technician pressed a few more buttons. She moved the scanner from one side of my stomach to the other, up and down. I felt sleepy and content. She asked, are you sure that your baby is 19 weeks? Both my husband and I answered softly, caught in our dream spaces. Yes. The technician was quiet too. She did more measurements. She shifted in her chair. She got up. She said in a bare whisper, excuse me. She left the room, closing the door firmly behind her. The screen was still on. I patted my stomach with light fingers. I wanted my baby to wake up, to move, to turn around, to turn toward me. I laughed at myself. Every direction the baby could possibly turn would be toward me. I patted my stomach some more. I said, baby, wake up. Mommy and daddy want to see you. Wake up. The door to the room opened with no warning. Two doctors came in. One was an older woman. She said, I'm Dr. Lupo. Perhaps only in a regular voice, but somehow it dispelled the mood of the room. The second woman, much younger, extend her hand to my husband. I don't remember her name, but she must have said it. I remember only that she was a resident. I remember only the feel of her hand on my left foot. Her hands were cool. She squeezed lightly. Dr. Lupo walked to the screen. The young woman kept her hand on my left foot. Dr. Lupo straightened her mouth. She tapped the keys a few times. She turned toward me. She was an actor in a play. Her, movement, her movements had been directed. Her words were pre-written. She said, I'm sorry, your baby is dead. The curtains closed on me. My world was dark. I listened for applause that did not come. We were three days from our first anniversary. It was August 3rd, 2012, when baby Jules was pronounced dead inside of me. My husband and I were presented with two choices. We could go home and wait for the baby to abort naturally or we could go to labor and delivery and the doctors could induce labor. My hands kept shaking on my belly. They moved like butterfly wings. We called our parents. My husband cried so much he couldn't speak. I took the phone from him. I said, we're at the hospital. The baby is dead. I couldn't get more words out. The calls died in my hands one by one. When there was no one else to call, my shaking hands returned to my belly. I kept thinking, you fan a fire into life, Galia, you fan a fire into life. The, tear, the tears welled up inside of me and exploded in my throat. We decided on option two. They induced me. The doctors who visited and the nurses in labor and delivery told me that the baby would come by nightfall. By the time evening had settled heavy and thick over the city, they told me that the baby would come by morning. In the dark of the night, I heard the screams of women in pain. I heard the cries of their babies being born. I turned from the walls toward the one window in the room. The window overlooked a church. There was a round stained glass window high on the church that depicted a figure of a man on his knees, his head bowed. I knew who the man was, although I did not belong to the Christian tradition. When I was a child and I was scared in the dark, 
I used to imagine the arms of my ancestors around me, holding me safe in the circle of their love. I listened for the quiet comfort of those who come before me, but all I heard was the hum of the machines around me. I sat still and quiet through the stretch of the night, waiting for day to emerge from the far eastern sky. I felt the weight of sorrow grow deep inside of me, centering deep and low in my belly. I curled on the bed in absent pain. My husband sat beside me in a chair. He had his head down, although I knew he was not asleep. I heard his cries each time a baby was born, somewhere on the ward. He gave voice to the cries choking my throat. Morning came in slowly, slow gray cutting into the folds of night. Then pink sunlight entered the room. The early morning nurses and doctors visited. They said, not yet. We shook our heads. They put more medication inside of me. It was noon, I could tell, because there were no shadows in the room, just the shine of the sun from the window, the wash of light from the fluorescent bulbs overhead. I wanted to go to the bathroom. My husband helped me up from the bed. He held my hand and we walked to the bathroom, much as we had on numerous other occasions inside the safety of walls within the hold of nature. He might have even swung our hands, as was his habit. Inside the bathroom, our walk was done. We stood side by side. I looked at his shoulders. He closed the door for a moment. He held me in his arms, and the world was very far away. He said into my hair, you have to let go. My arms fell from around him. I felt something drop in my belly, the weight I had been harboring deep inside of me, the child we had made but could not keep. The baby came. A little boy, mouth open like a little bird, a little boy who looked like a version of me, eyes closed, skin translucent, a little boy who weighed nothing in my arms, despite the weight I had felt with him inside of me, the weight of life, the weight of hope, the weight of humanity, the gravity of my little love story. His body was more light than anything else it could have ever been. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kala. We really, we really appreciate your transparency. I would like, like to now introduce to you, Jay. Jay Wallace uh, Skelton could not imagine being a mother, but being a seahorse papa, trans man who gave birth felt right. Jay is a parent to three children, ages five, 10, and 15 not all of whom Jay birthed. As a PhD candidate in curriculum teaching and learning at the Ontario Institute of Studies in Education, Jay's co-researching with children about creating queer and transcultural spaces in educational settings. Jay is committed to, the, to, to and informed by children's rights and am currently using visual facilitation. Jay is white, Jewish, fat, queer, trans, and thinks it's fair to declare those things here. Working hard to create justice and community in, intersectionality, in intersectional ways, Jay is very much a work in progress. Co-founder of Flamingo Rampant, which publishes uh, picture books with a joyful, feminist, racially diverse, LGBTQ+, with kid problem solvers. Jay's books for children are the newspaper pirates and the last place you look. Jay's middle school book, Transphobia, deal with it and be a gender transcender, aims to help middle schoolers challenge transphobia. Jay has written a bunch of things, a bunch of things for adult people too, for excuse me, for grown people too. I introduce to you, Jay. Thank you. Um, I always feel awkward as introductions get read. I'm really aware as we're having these conversations that we're all both having taboo conversations and that we're talking about miscarriage and stillbirth and loss and there's lots of pressure and tension not to have them. 
but we're also talking about trying to have babies that various people think we shouldn't have. And that the systems we live in have said, your babies are not the babies we want to see happen in our cultures and in our societies and in our spaces. And, and I think that adds a layer of difficulty to our own losses and our own griefs about how we interact with the broader societies. Um, I wanna say as a, a trans perspective, um, I think there's lots of pressure that trans men shouldn't be having babies, that if you are a real man, and I say that in heavy air quotes, um, you don't engage with fertility and you don't engage with making of babies. I think that there is also um, an awareness that there are states uh, and I mean governments that feel that in order to transition, you need to no longer be able to uh, reproduce. And so there are states that will require you in order to change a sex marker on your ID to no longer be fertile in any way, shape or form. So it feels subversive as a trans person to be trying to make uh, a new person in your own body. Um, and then to have that fail um, also then means you're engaging with systems that are designed for women that don't quite know what to do with you, that see you as an interloper, as a disruption, as a presence who shouldn't be there. Um, I'm gonna read a bit from a chapter I wrote for a book called Interrogating Pregnancy Loss, Feminist Writing on Abortion, Miscarriage, and Stillbirth. Uh, it's from Demeter Press and edited by Emily Lind and Angie Devineau. And I'm gonna breathe first. Um, and my chapter is called Failing, and, and the word failing is struck through because it felt both like failing and also like I needed to claim it back from failing at the same time. So I began with, as a trans person, I am used to my body failing me. This is the expected narrative. This ushers in a story of puberty in the wrong direction, of breasts where a previously flat chest was preferred, and of bleeding. Puberty sucked in those ways, but it also made me fuzzy, and the chest hair and facial hair was and is delightful. My body is like me, able to excel in some areas and shite in others. As a trans person, I am used to my body failing me is a softer version of the official trans narrative, I was trapped in the wrong body. This is not my narrative. Frankly, there are a great many people who learn to say this because it is what gender clinics and people reading trans autobiographies expect to hear. Some people feel that, but many of us do not imagine our bodies as cages. I am not trapped in my body. This is my body and I live here and in living here, I need to make this a place that I can live and thrive. I've learned to value strength and power in my limbs. I've learned to love my stamina. I've learned to come home to my imperfect flesh. In seeking to be pregnant, I felt like I needed to feel at home in my body before I could invite somebody else to live in it with me. I clean the house before company comes over too. I want my home to be better for other people than it is for me alone, and I wanted that in my body. My mother wanted to know if I miscarried because of the testosterone. It's possible that other people wanted to know that too, but they didn't ask. The question slams through my chest, demanding to know if my body failed at pregnancy because I am trans. My mother doesn't know my medical history, doesn't know medical science, and in the absence of either, her question is built out of transphobia and fear. I hear blame. Rationally, I know that pregnancies fail, not bodies, but still self-reproach is more familiar. I don't wanna blame the being that will never now be born. I don't wanna blame myself. I don't want blame at all. I just want to mourn, and I don't know how to answer her question. I don't have it to lovingly strip away the assumptions and the transphobia, and I don't have an answer at that moment. I don't have a pregnancy either, and I'm angry that she skipped on to looking for why as I am still in the throes of no. After the first miscarriage, we decided that we would tell people when we got pregnant. Not telling people means that you either miscarry without support or you find yourself telling people about the pregnancy and the miscarriage at the same time. After the first miscarriage, we decided that we would tell the people we wanted on the journey with us. If there was joy, we wanted to be able to share it. And if there was mourning, we wanted to be able to share that too and mourn together. 
Not telling people I was pregnant had not protected my feelings. It had not protected the pregnancy. It may have protected my friends from knowing of our miscarriage, but the cost of isolation and the denial of intimacy. So the next time there were two lines, we shared our news. Miscarriage made that next pregnancy feel vulnerable. And instead of feeling pregnant, I felt a little bit pregnant. When this pregnancy too became one that was not going to result in a baby, we told people. I wrote about it in part so that I didn't have to talk about it all the time. And in naming our miscarriage, I discovered that failure is inherently part of having a body. Almost all the people I know who've tried to create babies have experienced miscarriage. Some have experienced it over and over again. It was incredibly helpful to know how common this was and to mourn my loss and their losses and to feel broken in community. It felt like there was a giant conspiracy of silence around miscarriage and the silence had fostered shame and blame and guilt and the sense that everyone else had perfect bodies that did as they wanted them to. Suddenly, we were all imperfect together. I want to jump to near the end of the piece. I am my body. We are inseparable. But I'm also a hybrid, a chimera. Increasingly, science recognizes that fetal cells cross into the gestational parent, living in us and becoming part of us. This is true for the two children that I birthed and for the two pregnancies that did not result in babies. My body is mine and my pregnancies are written into it. I love the idea that this makes pregnancy into a trancing of our bodies. I was just me and now, now I have company in my body, cells that I made and are not me. As the two I birthed grow and I know more and more about them, I imagine their personalities in the cells that I still carry. I don't get to know any more about the two that never came into being but I imagine their cells within me. We are all intimate. The body does not discriminate between the ones who arrived and the ones who did not. And I have a tiny chorus of others inside me. Sometimes I imagine this genetic photo album inside me in my blood. I know that even the traces of those ones that never arrived get to come home in my body. Neither miscarriage was a total loss. My body continues to sustain tiny parts. And I love that my body remembers. Thank you, Jay. We also appreciate your transparency and your willingness to share such a unique story um, that is probably more common than we think. And I think that you sharing will serve as a platform for others to share theirs as well. So thank you. We turn to last but certainly not least, Las Hermanas Iglesias is a project-based collaboration of Lisa and Janelle Iglesias. Born in, in Queens, New York to Norwegian and Dominican immigrants, their multidisciplinary work explores issues, issues of hybridity, social participation, and family. In addition to their individual practices, the two have collaborated on, on, gen, or, on, genre, on genre, excuse me, genre blaring projects over a decade. Their collaboration has evolved to incorporate a variety of relationships and structures for collectivity, including the creation of textile projects and performances, performances with their mother, Bold High, excuse me, Bold Hill Iglesias. Anchored to the philosophies and context of intersectional feminism, teamwork, and multiplicity, Las Hermanas creates create artworks that disrupt categories, engage absurdity, and promote the, and promote the benefits of working together. We introduce to you Las Jimenez Iglesias. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, we're gonna switch our screens to our screen sharing. And as before we begin, we'd like to uh, share some gratitude. Uh, we're going to thank uh, NMSU, especially Marissa, Jasmine, and Courtney, and Frank. Uh, we're going to thank Kim for moderating and all the panelists, Shannon, Kalia, and Jay, uh, for sharing your experiences. Excuse me. Uh, this presentation is dedicated to Luna Astrid Gerlitz Iglesias, passed and birthed on May 1st, 2019, and Avery Dawson Ostrander. 
If any of you have lost a loved one, we invite you to place their name in the chat for us to honor them. As Marissa mentioned, this panel is part of the programming that accompanies the inaugural exhibition at the museum that we are so excited to be a part of. Um, the project uh, that's featured in the exhibition is actually a textile installation that was created, created in collaboration with our mother, Bodhild. Um, it also incorporates weavings done by her mother, our grandmother, and an audio tour uh, by Lisa's son, Bowie, who was seven at the time of the recording. Um, our collaborative practice has evolved over the past 15 years, uh, working together to include intergenerational projects and to respond to our personal and familial lives as they change and evolve. Uh, we are interested in challenging boundaries between disciplines such as painting and sculpture and between this idea of a being a strict boundary between the personal and the professional. In that spirit of uh, blurring boundaries, we have made this takeaway poster, Struggles Are Interwoven. Uh, and I think that as we present this, the information that we're going to share, we want to share that we don't view uh, the sort of personal experience of stillbirth or miscarriage or other losses as individual autonomous isolated events, but rather cast within a collective experience and a spectrum um, that involves our bodies, our rights and our autonomy. And in the spirit, we don't silo stillbirth and miscarriage from issues such as maternal mortality, abortion, access to health care, et cetera. Um, I think you know, some of the intentions for this palette, for this panel um, rather, spring, for, spring from the idea of how common uh, stillbirth and miscarriage are. Stillbirth affects about one in 160 births, and each year about 24,000 babies are still born in the United States. And this was definitely a statistic that I was not aware of. Uh, and miscarriage, about 20, 10 to 20% of known pregnancies uh, happen each year, and that number we know to be uh, much larger. Uh, Due to the consequences of systemic and institutionalized racism, Black and Indigenous communities experience stillbirth disproportionately as compared to other communities. We wanted to nod to this New York Times Magazine article from 2018 as a good resource for contextualizing these statistics. Um, it was a great resource for us to learn more about why these inequities exist by outlining specifically different effects of historic and contemporary racism. We also wanted to note that all of the resources that we mentioned through the presentation uh, will have been documented in a kind of Google Docs that we'll be sharing with um, the audience through the chat. And that resource list will also be pasted in the web page for today's events if you're watching this um, recorded um, as well. Uh, we also want to make sure that we uh, make a note that our intention is to frame this conversation through the lens of reproductive justice. Um, as Lisa said, because these are not isolated inst instances, rather these pregnancy events are symptomatic of larger problems within public health and within the culture um, and, and are, you know, inextricably tied to racism and sexism. Um, Sister Song, which is a great organization uh, that was founded in about 1997, uh, defines reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in sustainable communities. So the work that we're going to share today uh, is cultural production that intersects with experiences of pregnancy and birthing. And as visual artists, we definitely try to find our grounding through relating to different ways that people process these experiences. Um, in this image, uh, I'll tell a little bit about it. Since 2012, we've been engaging in an ongoing project entitled Commissarates, which began as part of our competition series, which is a performance and photography series in which Janelle and I visualize and focus on our sibling dynamic. Commissarates began during my first pregnancy in 2012 as a series in which Janelle mimics the physicality of my pregnant belly with objects in a series of photographs suggesting references to empathy, longing, and futility. And we continued this project in my, um, in my pregnancy in 2019 um, in the same spirit um, in different ways, including a photo shoot on the beach in which Janelle uses sand uh, to create the belly. Um, this pregnancy uh, resulted in stillbirth, and rather than letting the project go or ending it, 
uh, we return to our practice as a context to hold space for the changes in our life and to um, honor this continuum of her being that it's she's con continually becoming. Uh, and we're excited to show to present and share with you other cultural producers who are dealing with issues of reproductive justice and other projects around birth, such as Taja Lindley, a multidisciplinary artist and activist. Her birth justice podcast, NYC, takes a look at how folks in New York City experience and navigate reproductive oppression and create resilience strategies for their health and their families. Recently, Taja Lindley served as sexual and reproductive justice consultant at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, facilitating a community-driven process that created the New York City standards for respectful care at birth. So please feel free to uh, look for um, the Instagram handle and listen to the podcast wherever you find your podcasts. Jillian Marie Browning is an interdisciplinary artist based in Florida. In her words about the project, is it worth dying for? The pain, feelings, and concerns of Black women are consistently ignored within the medical community in the United States, resulting in disproportionately high death related to pregnancy and childbirth. In the artist's words of Andrea Chung, her work examines cultures created under the influence of colonial and post-colonial regimes. Quote, I mine foodstuffs, recipes, and archival materials such as photographs and tourist publications in order to reconstruct and create a new series of narratives, which I juxtapose against the stories told by the colony to sell romantic notions about nature and labor. This mixed media installation, Pure, um, uh, was her contribution to the Jamaica Biennial in 2017. Her work strongly focuses on processes and materials such as sugar and soap, both with, res with resonate with the narratives she unravels and reconstructs. Uh, this piece is part of a larger project uh, based on the research she conducted um, on traditional midwifery in Jamaica. Pure consists of sculptures made of soap cast from the hands of Jamaican midwives. Um, and another quote from the artist, I'm interested in exploring the ways in which colonialism has impacted the land and our bodies. I also want the viewer to understand the ramifications of colonialism and not to see it as something that has happened in the past um, and so something that has resolved itself to where we are now. Colonialism has never ended, it only evolved. And different iterations of this piece um, Lisa, if you can tab backwards. In different iterations of this piece, viewers are actually invited to wash their hands with the casts of soap. So what we're looking at is somebody washing their hands and, and there's casts of these midwives' hands made out of black soap. Another project um, that also deals with uh, celebrating traditional medicine and traditional ways um, is, uh, that, that Andrea's um, uh, been working on is uh, an earlier project called Midwives and Crowning, a series of collages. And in this series, Andrea explores the practice of Black midwives in the Southern United States and in the Caribbean, connecting traditional medicine with maternity care. Another artist project that we wanted to share is Peruvian artist Romina Schulz. Um, we, share, we share this project that incorporates uh, textiles and ceramics, clandestinas. And clandestinas portrays the emotional stage of being pregnant with an unwanted pregnancy within the context of a location uh, like Lima, Peru, where abortion is illegal. Uh, the project is about the healing process of aborting the emotional burden that accompanies the physical procedure. The artist writes, most of the time, the discussion about abortion rights in, in countries where it's illegal is focused on when life starts. I changed that approach to the women's emotional and physical situation, a context that has been missing from all the debates. In a context where pregnancy's interruption is illegal, where you do not own your own body, surviving abortion becomes a privilege. Other works in the series include Atraso Menstrual, uh, which images the risk of back alley interventions from the misspelled name to the size and fragility of the ceramic knitting sticks that you see in the sculpture. Uh, the artist writes, en la garganta, la pena, in the throat, the pain. The long knitting, which becomes a weight through its length, exposes the sorrow of hiding a procedure that ended up defining me. Another project we wanted to highlight um, 
that deals with access to abortion is A Quiet Inquisition, a, a film by Hall and Sabrina Khan and Alessandra Zecca. At a public hospital in Managua, Nicaragua, an OBGYN doctor struggles with her conscience as she contends with the harrowing implications of a new law that prevents the termination of any pregnancy, even when a woman's life is at stake. The law went into effect in 2006, and it does not ex um, allow for any single exception for a legal abortion, not even in cases of rape, incest, or when the mother's life is at risk. And to quote the directors of the film, we aim to highlight the issues at stake in regards to reproductive rights and its impact of maternal health and the autonomy of doctors to make radical decisions. Though the story is centered in Nicaragua, the issues and repercussions um, and debates cross borders. In our resources list, there's information about a free upcoming screening, screening on September 27th as part of the Global Health Screening out of the UK. And there's also a link to um, stream it on iTunes as well. Eleanor Harris Slavic is an artist and educator based in North Carolina. In her sculpture, Armor of Loss, she focuses on the connections between abortion and childbirth. In her words, how all these possibilities and losses and lives stay connected. Egg, ova, organ, and planetary-like, this object is grounded and heavy. Based in Massachusetts, multidisciplinary artist Daisy Patton paints portraits of women who died because abortion was illegal. In her words, searching through newspaper archives, yearbooks, and periodic internet articles that attempted to remind the general public of the horrors of pre-Roe versus Wade, I collect as much information as is available to recreate what each woman looked like based on these photos and any identifying information. Lucia Cuba tackles the subject of abortion in her textile pieces, visualizing reproductive justice and activism. And Casey Arnold responds to the subject of miscarriage. From the artist's statement, weeks after seeing a sonogram of my baby's healthy heartbeat, I experienced a miscarriage. I struggled with the loss for a long time and felt isolated by the experience. It wasn't until later that I learned how common miscarriage is and that one in four pregnancies end in miscarriage. Likewise, Natalie M. Godinez contends with the reality of miscarriage in her textile work. And Crystal Tursich contends with miscarriage through a series of photographs. Elena Brotherus, based in Finland, confronts issues of infertility in her series of photographs. And Amelia White focuses on stillbirth through her project, The Ugly Placenta. From the project statement, The Ugly Placenta is a multimedia work in progress. It is based on the artist's personal experience with undiagnosed severe preeclampsia and the stillbirth of her son at 37 weeks. Preeclampsia is caused by a problem with the placenta during pregnancy, and the project examines this through writing, drawings, and animation. In addition to sharing the work of these artists, we also wanted to highlight some organizations doing really important birth justice work. And we found that sharing resources and collectively processing these realities is one of the many ways we can help support each other to take steps towards decreasing rates of wanted pregnancy loss, um, as well as making this topic less taboo. Uh, each of these organizations promotes and shares programming and resources related to what we've been talking about today. So as we've already mentioned, Sister Song, um, Ancient Song Doula Services based out of New York City. Um, there's also, uh, we wanted to highlight Tewa, which is a Native women-led community-based organization in the ancestral Tewa homelands in northern New Mexico, and part of their programming is involved in addressing the challenges of reproductive health and justice, specifically for Indigenous women. Eri Guajardo Johnson, aka the Birth Bruja, is a biracial trauma-informed birth doula, rape crisis peer counselor, wellness coach, community organizer, and host of the Birth Bruja podcast. Uh, she hosts workshops, events, and screenings, and we wanted to um, give a shout out to an upcoming screening that's happening, uh, an upcoming workshop that's happening next Saturday, and it's about supporting folks through the loss of wanted pregnancy with facilitator Brooke Patmore at the Born um, from Born Collective SF. And again, this will be in our shared evolving resources list. 
The links and the resources that we've mentioned in our presentation are located in an online document, which we'll paste in the chat. And the link will also be available on the NMSU Alone Together programming website. Uh, there will be two kind of documents. One is one that Janelle and I created, and at the bottom of the document, there will be a link to an open source editable a Google spreadsheet that we invite you to contribute. Um, as some of the other panelists have mentioned, I think feeling quite alone, even though it's such um, a common event, uh, just sharing resources is a way to process um, these very common experiences. So thank you so very much. Um, I'm going to stop the share and I'm gonna hand it back to Kim. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa and Janelle. Um, at this time, um, I guess we will turn uh, the camera inward. Um, I would like to first and foremost thank and honor all of the panelists who have courageously shared their stories today. Um, we know um, that this is not unique to any one individual and that um, many of us have suffered in silence. And so you all have created a platform that is much needed I also want to say thank you to the NMSU Art Gallery um, for understanding the importance of this platform about bringing awareness to such an agonizing experience. I have to admit that when Le uh, Marissa first reached out to me, I thought that she knew my story. <laughs> I had never met her before and I had never um, heard about this work. And so when she reached out to me about being a part of this, surely I thought my, I was I was found out that <laughs> I could no longer hide. And so at the time, she also did not know that I shared um, very intimately um, an experience in, uh, along this topic. Um, I must admit to you that this is the most vulnerable thing that I have ever done. Um, this is the first time that I have ever publicly shared my story. I speak to you today, not as a therapist who has literally counseled hundreds not as a professional director who has served thousands over 20 plus years, but as a mother who at the age of 40, 10 years ago, buried her only child as a result of senseless healthcare injustice. The indescribable haunting of hearing the words, there is no reason that your son should not be here, still haunts me today. Clinging to life for over three days in 2010 in what could only be described as a scene out of this drama series ER, I lived the torment of feeling my once vibrantly growing, expected to be 6'3", son dying inside of me. I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. I could hear everything that was going on around me but no one could hear my screams. In what, in what I could only describe as dissociation, I, could fully grasp, I couldn't fully grasp what was happening and in many ways I still can't. While I still grapple with the dreaded question of being asked, do you have children? I ask that you please be patient with me as I still feel somewhat guarded in this very public platform but I want to say to you that first and foremost, you are not alone if you have recently or ever encountered such an experience of losing a child, regardless of if you have additional children or not, a loss is a loss and it is a very devastating loss. I also would like to say and acknowledge that at the time of my loss, as a professional, I had nowhere to go. There were no support groups. There was nothing for me. And so this work is even more meaningful as I am over a thousand miles away from everything and everybody that I know. This is my new home in New Mexico and I am grateful to everyone on this panel and all of you who are tuning in that understand the need to have this conversation and to provide a network of support for each other. I would also like to say to every doctor, to every medical professional, that we have to do better. There are reasons that are unknown to us why we don't have our children, but there are opportunities for you 
to better understand the needs of women of color, of trans people, of minorities, and of women in general. This is a call to action from me to you. You have to do better. You have to do better. Please, you have to do better. I would also like to say to Cornerstone of Hope in Cleveland, Ohio, my hometown, you were literally my lifeline after six months of burying my son. You helped me to understand that I wasn't alone and that there was help available to me and to so many others. Thank you for every year honoring my son and so many other mothers and fathers and families who have lost babies and uh, loved ones through your memorial every year. Your efforts are not unseen. I would also like to thank and honor the Preeclampsia Foundation for all of the work that you are effortless, effortlessly doing to save babies and to help mothers to thrive as I was on my deathbed as well while losing my son. I would also like to say to every mother out there who is continuously struggling, we hear you, we understand, we are in the trenches with you, and please don't ever feel that you have to su uh, suffer in silence anymore. Our voices, this work that we are doing today, the level of vulnerability that we are extending is for you. We get no glory out of sharing the horror that we have lived through, but if sharing our stories helps you to survive one more minute, to help you to find strength in one more second, it's all worth it. And I know that I share and I speak on behalf of every panelist here. It's a never ending journey. And so we are here with you, for you. And we wanna say thank you for everyone else who has contributed and supports this meaningful work. We appreciate you. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I forgot to say, I wanna to say to my son, Andrew Jeremiah Ford, I love you beyond life, son. Now we would like to turn um, to the collective conversation at this point. And so I would like to pose a question to Shannon. Um, can you share one particular thing that made you or motivated you and said to you that this is the moment that I have to do this now? So when you say this, can you clarify what this is? Sure. Writing the book um, that you have just written, that work, because I know that you are an author and you write about many topics, but what, what said to you this and now? And I think, um, and I will invite, uh, thank you for that wonderful question. And Kimberly also, um, you know, it's so emotional, you know, hearing, um, hearing another woman, and for me, another Black woman, you know, ex express these things. Um, and uh, so I just want to thank you for your bravery, you know. So, um, but I want to, with this um, very powerful and important question, I also want to um, invite um, my dear friend and um, co-editor, um, Kyle Kali Yang, to also answer it because, um, we, of course, um, the project is just really um, both of our hands together, <laughs> along with um, all the hands of the woman um, in the collection um, and beyond. And so, I mean, what I can say is I tried to kind of express some of that in the portion of the introduction that I read. Um, Obviously, losing a baby is a, a, a huge, hugely traumatic experience. Um, and then 
when it's not talked about in the larger society, it becomes like a second death in many ways. And um, so, you know, for me, you know, like I think a lot of women, it's sort of like, okay, physically recovering from an experience like that is one thing. And then emotionally and psychologically, I mean, I don't want to use the word recovering, but I will say kind of, you know, as you say, going through the process, right? Going through the experience in all of its facets through time. Um, yes, hi, sweetheart. Okay. <laughs> and um, so I think it was, you know, I lost my daughter, my first daughter in 2013. Um, and then I had my second daughter, um, the one who's hiding behind the couch right now, um, the, the next year in, in 2014, Marwen. Um, and it was probably, I don't know, two, was it two or three years after that, Kalia? What was the time frame there where I, I, I saw a Facebook post that I did a Facebook post in 2011 when I lost baby Jules. I was very pregnant, very open about that loss. You know, I, and, and so Shannon saw that post. When she lost Sienna, I was in the hospital about to give birth to my oldest, Xing Yang, uh, my, my daughter, my soon to be seven year old daughter. And just, a, you know, I saw Shannon's post and I, I had this decision to make should I induce this pregnancy, which is full term, or should I continue waiting? And that her post made the decision for me. So we, there was already beyond our knowing this connection that was happening. Just three weeks after that, Shannon wrote me and Shannon said, Kalia, um, one day when I'm, when I'm ready, would you ever consider? Because you know, we had both been looking and there was nothing. And so the immediate answer was yes. When our childbearing years are through, when these stories, we can see where they rest. Um, let us let us team up and do this. We both knew, I think Shannon and I both knew instinctively that we couldn't do this alone. We had to come together to do this. It's too, it's too, I mean, no. it's too hard. It's just too, it, the, the, um, the stories and, you know, as Kalia said, like the, you know, she says many times, like the woman deeply felt stories, you know, that we have in this collection, but, but they're, they're hard to hold. They're very hard. They are, you know, as a refugee, there are no statistics about what happens to refugee women with, with miscarriage or infant loss in this country or around any of the camps. Um, I know women, all the women in my life have lost children somewhere in the process. My mother lost seven. So I, I wrote her piece also for what God has honored here. It's called either side, just seven living and seven dead. Either side could be home when the, when the numbers are so even, right? Shannon and I also understood that this book would be understood and be read in the history of women who have lost children. You know, refugees like the Hmong lost children to war. When the CIA came, they got soldiers seven, eight, nine, ten years old to fight and to die on America's behalf. You know, both boys and girls. In the African American experience, there was, of course, this long tragic history of slavery. And now there is, you know, the, the prison complex that we're dealing with. There are children at our, at our southern borders who are getting taken from their mothers. There's a different kind of loss in the experience of the Native Americans. Of course, we all know about how they took the children away to be institutionalized. And so it was going to, it was going to be aligned here in this history, in this moment. It was a convergence of so much. The question was not, what is now the time? It was, we waited way too long, you know? Let us do this and let us do it together. And let us call across the width and the breadth of this nation for all of these women in sisterhood to do this with us. I mean, there's a great deal of urgency to this work and you can hear it in my voice. You can see it in, in all of our faces. It needed to be done. And thankfully, um, Shannon wrote me that email and we did it. And, and, and then to, to be a part of this panel, to see what all of you are doing is so incredibly inspiring and moving. You know, the world is less scary because you're all here, no matter what happens. And, and that is the gift that I think we can give to each other. That's why I let Kalia do a lot of the talking because you see what happens, you know. Um, but I do have to say like, um, I mean, everybody's presentation has been so impactful. Um, I, I have learned 
so much actually the field of um, visual uh, art is not my field and I don't know a lot about it and so um, will that slideshow be available as well afterwards because that was really um, that that was really interesting yeah we could do that and the most of what we mentioned is in the resource list but we can we can totally make the slideshow public as well thank you Shannon we could put that onto the website as well so thank you ladies I am truly inspired um you know some time ago, I, I ventured and aspired to write a book to share my experiences, but the shame and the, the, the feeling of isolation um, paralyzed me, to be frankly honest, because I had not heard anyone else really talking about it. So you all have truly inspired and encouraged me. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, if, we, if we can, let's, let's, Jay, do you mind talking to us just a little bit about um, your experience as a transparent and uh, pun <laughs> transparent, <laughs> but um, can you can you talk to us a little bit about how specifically the medical community um, can be better educated about working with um, trans um, with trans people and trans families to bring about a greater sense of equity and a greater sense of integrity to the profession that they have pledge to commit themselves to regardless of gender, race, and whatever. So I think that's an excellent question. Um, there is data from both Canada and the US that talks about the frequency with which trans and non-binary people avoid medical assistance because our experiences have so frequently been discriminatory and frankly sometimes deadly. Um, and, and I can you know, think of my own stories of going to an ER, you know, not being able to breathe and having them want me to drop my pants first and being really clear that I am not breathing with my genitals. Like, I, why, why is that the thing that is going to allow me to get the medication that I need? And I, you know, I say this as an asthmatic who's got tendencies for pneumonia. I knew what was going on. I knew what was going to render help and that wasn't coming. Um, so I think, you know, it's some of the concepts we've been talking about. It's bodily autonomy, uh, that people get to be in their own bodies and make choices for their own bodies. It's a recognition that we know our bodies best and need to be heard and honored in those moments, that we will talk about our bodies in ways that are appropriate for us, uh, and that's our names and our pronouns and the words for the parts of our bodies and our connections to spirituality and community. Um, and a refusal to let medical communities tell us otherwise. Um, and I can think of how frequently medical communities have not listened to people and how devastating and deadly that can be. Um, and I think really what I'm looking for is a profound awareness that um, our gender and our fertility don't have to be tied together and that people need to be able to make their own choices around both pieces uh, and navigate them as is appropriate for them. And, and I say that recognizing that lots of people don't have choices and don't have access to the services that they desperately need in terms of either their gender or their fertility. Um, so it, yeah, lot, lots of, I mean, some of it is about education and training, but some of it is also about access and money and what gets funded and who gets access to what that is funded. Um, I'm bad at ending the sentences. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think that you uh, shared a great segue just about access and health care. Um, and this is a question I pose to any of the panelists. Can you talk about um, the sense of urgency for uh, health care reform for um, vulnerable populations um, who do not have access to the quality health care that um, most people take for granted? And again, that question is open to any of the panelists. I mean, I'll just start, you know, just as a, looking at things, you know, in terms of Black women's um, maternal mortality rates, but, you know, also, you know, in terms of their <sighs> their babies, right? I mean, it's, um, 
Tressie McMillan Cottom has this, uh, you know, I don't know if people are familiar with her work, um, brilliant so black feminist sociologist, and she has a collection of essays called Thick, and, and um, I'll, I'll look for it, maybe post the link here in a minute, but she, she had this essay in time, it was excerpt um, from one in uh, Thick, that I just felt like encapsulates this whole, so much of what black women go through. And Catherine Squires too, who's a, a wonderful contributor um, in our um, collection, What God Is Honored Here, also talks about this, right? Where, you know, she's like, here's Serena Williams, you know, who's um, in the hospital um, and she's, you know, knows her body, right? Like, you know, I, I, I just, the profound connections, and I don't mean, I hope, Jay, you don't take this as sort of like trying to um, diminish the particularity of the trans experience in any way, but so much of what you're saying resonates to me, with me in the way that black women are treated by the medical profession. No one believes us. No one listens to us when we tell them what is going on with our bodies. They think we don't know, right? And so, you know, in this essay, um, you know, like Kath Catherine Squires is saying, you know, what chance do the rest of us have, Black women have, if like this, you know, um, rock star, celebrity, you know, internationally renowned sports heroine, superhero, you know, Serena Williams, she can't, her nurses can't listen to her when she tells them that she needs blood thinners and she almost dies, right? What chance do the rest of us have? And in this essay in, in uh, Tracy McMillan Connum's, um, you know, uh, collection that appeared in Time, it was the same thing, you know? It's like she's telling this woman on the phone, um, I'm having this intense pain, I need something. And she's describing, you know, like bleeding and this and that, oh, it's nothing. You don't need to, you know, and, and then she's rushed, you know, to the hospital when of course it's not nothing. She's, she's having a miscarriage and, um, and, the, and then of course the, the, the doctor, the white doctor, the white nurse and, you know, but it's not always, you know, it's not always, let's be clear, you know, um, they're like, oh, well, you should have said something, right? And so it becomes this thing, I mean, this is, this is what's demoralizing to me. And I think that the, the um, article um, that you posted from the New York Times Magazine from 2018 really delves into this. What's demoralizing for me about this whole whole problem in the medical establishment of, of not listening to vulnerable populations, of not listening to Black women, and not listening to trans folks, not listening to Native folks, and all this, you know, it's, it's demoralizing for the same reason that it's demoralizing for me as an upper middle class mom of a Black son, which is that it doesn't matter what your class status is. I mean, it's well documented now, right? I mean, you can, you can be you know, I have two master's degrees. Um, my children's father has one master's degree, you know, with comfortable, safe. That's still not going to protect my son from being, you know, profiled in school and, you know, the six times, being six times as likely, for example, to be um, suspended than his white peers, right? And, and, and this is what's worse about black women. The more education you have, the worse your maternal mortality outcomes. Excuse my French, but that is fucked up, right? And you see it. That's why the Tressie McMillan Cotton piece is so interesting because you see it in that piece. The more she asserts, I mean, she's a brilliant woman, and the, but the more she asserts her brilliance, the less they listen to her. So how do we go about changing these deeply held biases. I mean, you know, I just read Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. He would just call it racism, right? I mean, I, but how, how do we do that? How do we change these behaviors that have these horrible outcomes? I mean, I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm a, you know, editor, I'm a community, I try to organize communities. I like to believe that that does, that makes a difference, right? But um, 
I, I also know that like in the political realm, changing things is not the same as the artistic realm. Like you're, do, you're doing two different things. I'll be quiet now. Well, thank you for saying that, Shannon. And I completely agree the question, how do we change it, right? Very few people know who the Hmong are. We're this tiny minority here because of the secret war in Laos, secret because we're not in the history books. You read about what happens in Vietnam, you read about the Vietnamese and the Americans, you don't, you don't hear about who the Hmong are. We are the most linguistically isolated group in America. With that aside, the most taught book across medical schools is and vitamins the spirit catches you and you fall down. That is, for these medical doctors, their first introduction to working with a minority group, right, a non-English speaking group. Um, in the book, everybody talks about in schools across this nation. I've, I've, I've had opportunities to cross all 50 states speaking at universities. Everybody brings up that book and they want to know what I think about the cultural, the cultural clash, right, between the Hmong traditional belief system, the cosmology of my people, and this modern technologically savvy uh, white mainstream. Nobody wants to talk about white supremacy. It isn't a matter of cultural clash. You know, that is not the problem there. That is a problem of white supremacy. The Hmong never had a chance against the medical system of the United States, against the, the governmental, the armed forces of the United States. We never had a chance. But when students are being taught that it's a cultural clash, when those are the questions coming at you, right? And that is one of the most asked questions whenever I go anywhere from Yale to, to, to you know, a local community college. What do you think about Ann Fadiman's book? When that is the conversation, we're never going to get to the topic of it. The issue is white supremacy, right? Nobody has a chance against white supremacy, let alone this tiny little family, newcomers to America with no access to the language itself, right? And so until these conversations can honestly be had on those terms, when we still partake in that false equivalence, you know, as if we're all playing in the same field, nothing is ever going to change. And again, you know, Shannon and I, one of the Yes, we are, we're co-editors of this collection, but it's very rare to hear a black woman and Asian woman together or to see them together on the same stage. That's what we're discovering. Whenever we go anywhere with this book, people will take a step back. It is not only the volume of our voices or her elegant height compared to my own minor one. Uh, these relationships, these, these real love, the, the idea of real love, that's what needs to happen until our doctors love us there is going to be no change. And I don't know about you, but I've never had a doctor who even cared, let alone love me. Thank you so much. Um, before I um, ask a question of Lisa and Janelle, I did want to just kind of weigh in on, um, we talked about the, the injustice and um, Shannon, you you know, transparently shared about, you know, having your son. One of the things that I think that also goes unspoken and unacknowledged uh, is, you know, during all of these uh, protests and all of these things, um, you know, that this is also a trigger for many of us um, who have experienced loss because it is, as uh, Shannon so eloquently said, it's almost like a second death because you're, this, this type of injustice is not oftentimes on the agenda and when we talk about injustice and so just last night um, in black programs we had a conversation um, beyond the protest into the movement and so one of the things that I try to focus on is my area of influence and what I can actually do and so what my commitment to you all as a member of the Office of African American Affairs Executive Committee and also as the newly appointed member of the Governor's Board is that I will make sure that this type of injustice is brought to the forefront. And so that is a commitment um, that I can manage and that is a commitment that I can make and will make publicly to you all is that I will keep this in the forefront um, so that legislators that reach out to me, uh, senators and in other elected officials who reach out to me that they understand that this is also, you know, healthcare injustice is also an injustice um, that is intersection between races. And so um, thank you for sharing that. Lisa and Janelle, um, can you talk a little bit about how families can work together in the face of pregnancy loss? Yeah, thank, uh, I just want to start out by thanking everyone for sharing 
the amount, you know, the truth that you're sharing right now, and and that we're talking about this conversation that we're holding, this intersectional conversation about all the connections between these issues, I think is super important. Um, our yeah, Janelle and my work is all about this familial relationship, and um, and I think that you know, the, the, of course, the first people that I called when I found out that Luna had died uh, were my family members and. Uh, and it's just, you know, there's so many ways I think that we can support each other, whether it's family, whether it's chosen family, whether it's, you know, friend family, however you want to put it, there's so many ways I think that we can support each other. And um, in one of the ways that I think was most poignant to me is that Janelle took on a lot of the research to educate herself on how to advocate for me, instead of me telling Janelle about what I needed, because I didn't and I don't know. I mean, I'm maybe learning a little bit, but uh, it, definitely a year ago, I didn't know what I needed. And instead of Janelle wanting me to educate her, she she did the research and um, learned about different ways that she could show up, which is one of the first ways I think that we can support our friends and family is to literally just show up because there's no solving to be done. There's no making it better. Uh, I think the worst thing Thing that one could do is just to have absolute silence, which I think um, goes back to this idea of conversation and amplifying resources is one of the small things that we can do in the face of this public health crisis, which just I totally agree with this idea with, with the notion and the, the philosophy that that racism is a public health crisis. And um, I, what the topics that we're talking about today are woven in to this idea. Um, and Janelle, I'm going to pass it back to you because um, speaking on this idea of like familial collaboration and resource. Yeah, I think that, you know, I think everybody that I've talked to about um, this subject says it's, it's just so hard to talk about that I don't have words and kind of goes mute about it. Um, and because of that, our own self-consciousness around saying the wrong thing or not knowing what to say. I feel like that becomes such a huge barrier of being, um, uh, being able to offer companionship and support. And, uh, but one of the things then, and I'm one of those people who wanna please, who wanna like make things better, you know? And this wasn't a situation in which I could make it any better. There was no um, better. Our family couldn't make it better. Um, but what we could do in terms of uh, like Lisa said, I sort of, the first thing I did was, was to sort of go on this big search of, of, of uh, resources for families, for, uh, for Lisa, for, and to listen to her as much as I could. And I could hear her say, I need books. And so I went on this crazy uh, investigation of like what would make sense, um, not only topically, but also like kind of resonate that wasn't um, necessarily through a, um, a, a Judeo-Christian lens of, of um, looking at loss and grief and how to deal with that, or what were what were other um, like were there other books and and memoirs of folks um, that she could identify with? What were um, books that we could, as a family, all read and talk about, and if um, and and help maybe in understanding somebody else's experience also um, understand a little bit more about what. Uh, what Lisa was going through. And um, it's been such a, you know, I think one of the most beautiful gifts that we have are relationships with each other. Um, I was there for the birth of, of Lisa's son, Bowie, and um, in 2012, and it was one of the best uh, days of my life. It was such a beautiful experience. And I also felt like being able to be there and hold space and honor her experiences has also um, deepened my heart and my my own experience as a human in such amazing ways. And I, I feel so grateful um, for um, having that relationship to be to be in companionship. And so I think that um, one of the things that I've learned is this idea of how that we are not trying to fix anything, but how can we walk um, as companions and to take the lead of the person who's in grief, um, to not necessarily force them to talk at times that they don't want to, but to or to expect anything from them or expect their grief to look in a certain way, but to be completely open to however they need to experience it. 
um, as well. And to also to check in with the other family members um, about our own sense of um, insecurity about how we're doing as support uh, mechanisms, about collaboratively brainstorming how we can do better, how we can show up, um, how what, what we can do um, as well. And to make sure that it's not about us, to also kind of keep recentering um, the person who is actually experiencing that grief um, whenever those those kind of feelings do creep in because they do um, we all want to be we all want to be good at what we're doing we all want to show up for our family and be good partners and be um, be good people and we don't when we don't feel like we're doing that you know we have a tendency to also shut down so how can we open up um, rather than shut down Janelle can oh, I add a tiny thing on the end of that oh, yeah please do please do um, and my tiny addition would be to think about the ways that grief ripples out. And I think there is sort of some awareness that the person who has miscarried needs care and is grieving and in mourning. And it was so striking to me to have a conversation with my husband several months afterwards and him say, people supported you, people were there for you, and people didn't recognize that I was grieving and mourning too. And he wanted a space that allowed him to experience grief and mourn also in community. Um, and, and as we, and I appreciate people who use language of talking about miscarriage or stillbirth as not an isolated event or as not a single event, but to think about like, what's, what are the circles of grief and who is broadly impacted and how do we care for all of the grieving and all of the mourning people in those circles? Thanks for that, Jay. Yes, Jay, thank you. I think that you brought a very, very valid point that uh, especially for those of you or, you know, the, uh, those of those women who have lost um, children who have spouses or who have significant others that it is also, you know, their lived experiences as well. So thank you very, very much for bringing that to the forefront. Um, I would like to bring a question to the entire panel. Um, and that question is, I know for myself, uh, triggers were extremely um, uh, a sensitive thing for me in the very beginning of my loss. And so we have people um, who are tuned in who have recently lost, uh, experienced a loss. Can you talk a little bit about how you handle triggers? And I'll share an example of my very own. I had to shut down my private practice because the thought of seeing a pregnant woman um, triggered me. Um, the thought of hearing a crying child triggered me. And so it, everybody has different experiences. So if you could, if you don't mind, if you have had experiences like that, if you could share maybe for somebody um, in our audience who uh, is new, you know, to this whole experience and how to navigate those triggers. In, um, in the essay, I, I continue on, I'll read a little bit. I love flowers. Flowers have always been for me a symbol of life's beauty. You know, after the loss of baby jewels, I'm sure the flowers didn't want to trigger me, but they did, you know, and, and so I have two paragraphs here that I'll share. I looked at autumn, my favorite season, as I had never seen it before, barren, full of bold promises waiting to die. Words made no more sense. My annual garden dollar store pots <clears throat> Full of cheerful blooms, my geraniums, marigolds, begonias, impatience could continue living, but I didn't want them to. I stopped watering them. I watched them die. The blooms weathered first, then the leaves started drying out in the sun and the strong winds. I thought about watering them in those final days, so my heart was so heavy I could not find the strength. What did a few more days of bloom matter when in the end we would all die anyway? The autumn passed between moments of life feeling almost normal, me talking to people I love who loved me, trying to find perspective, and then other moments when I wish I had never met my husband and fallen in love with him, gone married, gone pregnant, when I wish I had never delivered a dead baby into the world, a baby the world would never know as mine. Then I would cry and cry until there were no more tears, until the throbbing in my head grew stronger than the beat of my own heart. I went outside in cold November. I looked upon my dead plants, pots full of earth and debris, spider webs where once petunias had bloomed. Small snowflakes started falling from the gray skies. The cold air cooled the heat in my chest. I breathed deep and watched as the white flakes began covering the world bit by bit. 
It was time. It was the snow coming, the changing, the dying of the things that I loved around me that somehow made the world through osmotic, I don't know, osmosis, whatever it was, made the world more, more even again, where I learned how to walk again with unsteady feet. I think that the triggers are everywhere to be found, but I have a very clear memory of my older sister coming after I, I lost baby Jules and she took her baby boy. He was two at the time. And when he came, the thing about baby Jules was that when I held him, I could see through his hands, it was translucent. And when Lolly came, he climbed right up on the bed and he put his, he put his head right to my heart and he held my hand. And I felt the strength of those fingers. And I looked and I couldn't see through them. And somehow that gave me the strength to, to live through that moment, you know? And it wasn't until I held the hands of my own boys, you know, little tiny boys with strong hands that gave me something back that moment. And so all these things happen and they happen in all kinds of ways, depending on who we are and where we're positioned and our relationship to all of these things, you know? But it took a while for me to love flowers again. It took me a while to love flowers again and that was okay. You know, when I looked at my mother, whose whole world is governed by the beauty of flowers, and I told her I don't love them anymore. And she said to me, that's okay. You know, and so all these moments come and they come in different ways for different individuals. And I think that's what we have to realize, that the triggers are everywhere, even in the beautiful things too. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I would like at this time to um, reiterate that um, we welcome you to uh, post questions in the chat. I do have one question and I'll open this to um, the entire panel. And it says, how do you even begin to look for resources and or community support in pregnancy loss, especially when you're navigating infertility? I live in a rural, fairly isolated area and have, uh oh, I'm sorry, the question disappeared, and have uh, really a really hard time finding resources, especially in this pandemic, I would be very interested in some book recommendations such as Janelle recommended. I think that's one of the issues that um, I can relate to after um, experiencing my stillbirth. I found that there were so many resources online, but I didn't feel at home with any of them. Uh, and it took a long time of my own personal research and also research of friends and family to, that shared that I, that I began to kind of connect constellation that felt more uh, inclusive of my experience. Um, and Kalia and Shannon have, and Jay have spoken about that a little bit as well, this idea that like our experience may not be reflected back in what's readily available. And um, which is one of the reasons why uh, Janelle and I put together the the resource list and finding that there 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 are books that will reflect your own experience and that there are documentaries and podcasts um, and one way that I found that helped me at first was to share my own experience on social media which didn't feel natural at first but once I did and getting private messages and responses, um, finding that I did have a community that I wasn't even aware of that already was there. That was, that's one way that that could possibly be helpful. Did anyone else want to weigh in on that? I think, I think I just want to reiterate what Lisa was saying in terms of, um, of allowing that vulnerability that you'll find uh, folks with similar experiences who have found resources that have worked for them are, are really um, up for sharing those resources. And Lisa and I also found that like once we found um, something like a podcast or something that we listened to that there were often notes or uh, folks mentioned within those resources that led us to other things and 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 also we, we kind of let our um, our curiosity kind of guide things uh, where then we would also sometimes um, you know share um, books on a kind of radical grief and how and radical empathy and connect the issues you know that we were experiencing to other issues and so our 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 kind of research or what we were um, these kinds of 
organizations, books, et cetera. Um, they, they kind of took all kinds of different paths. It wasn't a, a straight shot to finding the things that we needed. And one of the things we were excited about with putting together the resource list is that there's a link for other people to contribute to it as well. So hopefully this can become a kind of um, informal document that's circulated and that can include new headings, um, such as infertility, where folks can um, share with each other the things that are on their radar that have worked for them um, and, and kind of grow that dissemination of that information. And I think like in this time of activism, I've been so, um, uh, buoyed by so many open source documents and toolkits that people are sharing. And I think we are in a moment of kind of figuring out the right tools and resources in order to share information. Um, and so I think we, I think we all just, uh, you got to kind of keep at it and also um, to, to share our vulnerabilities so that people can also share resources with us. Thanks. And just a brief note on resources. Our book, What God is Honored Here, is available right now through the University of Minnesota Archive. Anybody can read it. Um, Shannon and I agree at the, at, at the outbreak of this pandemic that, that that was something that we wanted to do and it was an incredible initiative. So anybody interested can go and, and read the book. Thank you for free, right? Right, Kalia? Yeah, for free right now. Um, so it's part of the racial justice initiative. I'll, I'll find the link. And, and just along with the question, there was some, somebody in the chat was asking about um, grief counseling. Um, and um, did anyone here attend grief counseling after their respective losses? And, and did they find it useful? Um, I mean, I, I kind of, so I, first of all, therapy throughout my life for different things has been incredibly useful, but, but it's, it's, yeah, the therapist is raising her hand. Um, but, um, but also, um, you know, it's like anything else. It's like friends, it's like dating, it's like movies, like you, you have to find the right one or it's just all wrong, you know? Um, so, um, so that's kind of the caveat. Um, but I really appreciate sort of the methodology that Lisa and Janelle are talking about, the sort of circuitous kind of, you know, go try this, and then that leads you to this, and then you go to this, and that leads you to that, and, and you just, um, because the for, if you're like a historically, from a historically marginalized community, or whatever, you're not like cisgender, white, you know, uh, Christian, etc person then most of the resources that are going to come at you like first of all are just not going to speak to you they're just not you know and so it's like you have to have that staying power and that fortitude um to keep going um and so um <laughs> got a little bear over here um and uh you know for me i did go to a counseling group I only went like twice. It was for women who had um, loss. Uh, it was a pregnancy loss support group, basically. And I went only twice because I was like, everybody there, it just, their issues were so different from mine. You know, they were all, it was all other white people. And then it was me. So, that, and that was one thing. And then secondly, the bigger thing actually was that it was all these people that are having fertility issues. And it was like, they're, you know, it was a miracle pregnancy. It was, you know, like all this, which I have a lot of empathy for, but like, you know, and then they had all these problems through their pregnancy and all this stuff. And it's like, whereas my stillbirth was just sort of like one in a million, you know, it just wasn't. And so it, it just wasn't as useful for me. Um, so ultimately, I mean, honestly, a lot of my healing too has, and Kalia and I talk about this a lot, has been around creating community through and with this book, you know? Um, but I mean, I'm a writer, I'm an artist. That's what I, that's my methodology for working through um, the experiences in my life. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, there was this huge hole, right? And also a lot of this stuff that I, I always feel weird talking about is like, I'm like an elitist or something, but a lot of the writing about pregnancy loss is just really bad. <laughs> you know, like it just, 
I mean, I'm sorry to say it, but it's just, it's like these platitudes, you know, my angel, like you'll always, I mean, just, it, what does that mean? We don't even, and, and Kali and I, one thing that we were very emphatic about with the collection is that, you know, we wanted the writing to be really good, you know, and good in a way of um, grounded in the actual physical experience of what happens to your body when you lose a baby what, what, you know, not this sort of whatever, you know, like the, the film of Christianity or the film of, you know, capitalism or whatever it is, you know, whiteness. It's like, no, you know, like in my piece, it's like, I go into like, you know, this is what happens when like you have a stillbirth and like, you think you have to take a, a dump and it's your baby coming out, you know? And all of a sudden these two doctors rush up and they're holding your dead daughter in their hands. That's what it's like. It's not like, oh, my angel, you know, let's, and we've had women, it's been very healing for us. You know, we've had women, older women, a lot of older women actually have come up to us and have said, you know, a lot of older white women, frankly. I mean, I was moved to tears. This woman came up to me and said, you know what? It was so freeing to me just to hear you say the baby's dead because I felt like in my experience, it wasn't okay to just say that that was what happened. I had to dress it up and all this other stuff for other people and to carry that weight for years. Anyway, I'll be quiet, sorry. Um Marissa's going to wrap it up, but I do, I just want to share one other quick resource that I've, I'm sure that will, um, can help a lot of people, especially um, that have recently experienced um, infant and grief loss. Um, the Cornerstone of Hope, um, it is in Cleveland, Ohio, is an absolute godsend, and that is all that they specialize in. And so that was my go-to, and I'm sure that right now they're doing a lot of things that are virtual, and I'm sure that um, they have telehealth as well. And so they not only provide individual um, therapy and counseling, but they also do group work that includes art activities and those kinds of things. So I just wanted to share that resource, and I did put it in the chat. And I want to say that I see a few questions that came in and thank you so much for asking them, especially the question from Trenton that we haven't gotten to about, you know, what happens when grief stays alive beyond when people expect it to and they want this grief to end for the other people, maybe good intentioned or not. Um, I, your questions are um, uh, absolutely spectacular. What I would ask for anyone whose question was not answered in this at, during the time of this panel, that you can email the gallery, uh, the museum at artmuseum at nmsu.edu or on Lisa and Janelle's resource page, they've given um, their email address. And I'm sure if you had a question for a specific panelist that they might forward it on. Is that fair to say, Lisa and Janelle? Um, so, so I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Lisa, Janelle, um, Kalia, Jay, Shannon, and Kim, um, I've been floored by this panel. I, you know, I'm just absolutely stunned that you're able to share your stories and you're so vulnerable and it's such a vital conversation um, and so endlessly important for people. Um, to hear that they're not alone. And I hope that everyone realizes they're not alone. Something that Kim said a couple of times and it's just, um, it was really powerful for me to hear. Um, I will share the Google Doc one more time, but that will be on our Alone Together website, which is at uam.nmsu. Bye, thank you so much, that NMSU. Um, uam.nmsu.edu will be on our website. Um, and also this panel will be available on our website in about two weeks. We did record it um, and we would love you to share it. I saw a couple people comment that they wish they could teach from it or, or show it to their students or show it to doctors. You can, um, we will have it all available on the website. Please share it uh, widely. Um, 
Again, I want to reiterate that Labor Motherhood and Art in 2020, which this programming is associated with, has been extended to December 6th. I appreciate so much um, my co-curator, Laurel Nakadati, who's been here the whole time. We so appreciate you and all the hard work you did with this exhibition um, and your experiences. Um, and I want to thank the hundreds of people and you know the over nearly 100 people that joined us today um, for being part of something um, that we've, we, we've hoped has created a safe space, has a learning environment, a place where people can come. But, but, but for you to take two hours on a Saturday, um, it's really uh, humbling for us. And, and I mean that for the panelists, and I mean that for the audiences, and I mean for everyone who's joined us at each one of these Saturday events, both our Alone Together and our Mama Crate Ups. Um, it is mean the world for um, the UAM staff, Courtney, Jasmine, and the rest of us. Um, and we really want to recognize every single one of you for being part of this. And again, I wanted to thank the co-sponsors, the Art Department of Art, um, Department of English, Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Kim, thank you so much for moderating this for us. Um, we are so lucky to have you here at NMSU, um, and I'm really proud to have gotten to start to get to know you, and I can't wait to collaborate with you um, in the future. Uh, so please, um, again, um, go to the, this amazing resource that Lisa and Janelle are created for us. Um, please read the books uh, that have been presented to you today. Uh, and thank you so much for being here. We are really, really proud to have hosted this.